my my uh, 9-11 story starts, you know, just like a normal day for myself. I went to work where I worked for the Austin Highway Department. Um, at the time, I worked for uh, street lights and street signs. So on that day, I was doing street signs, just repairing street signs like a normal day. Um, I went to the deli around nine o'clock or so. And um, there was a bunch of people like, you know, your normal deli. And we had heard over the radio that a plane had hit the uh, one of the towers. So everybody was inside the deli and we were just speculating because at that time there weren't TVs and delis. So, we, you know, everybody just thought it was a small Cessna type plane. So, you know, we just, you know, everybody's talking. And um, I got my egg sandwich, I got my coffee, I get in my truck, and I'm trying to figure out where I was going to have uh, coffee that day. And then I turned on the radio and I heard that it was a very large plane that had uh, went into the towers. So right away, I just think like, hey, let's go to the firehouse so we could watch TV at least and see what was going on. So I pull up and we get there and I'm there was an old timer. His name was Clayton White. And um, we were just talking back and forth between the two of us. Um, I took my coffee. And then next thing you know, we're watching TV. And the second plane hit the, the second tower. So I looked at him and he, and he kind of looked back at me. And I, was, I said, we're going to the city. And he goes, no, nah, we're not going to the city, kid. I said, I'm telling you, we're going to the city. This is going to be a major event. We had two planes into the towers. So we sat there watching it burn, watching it burn. It was just absolutely gut-wrenching to, you know, just to, to watch these towers burn on TV. It was, it was terrible. Looked at him again. I was like, Clayton, we're going. I was like, you want to go get to your car and get something ready? And then two seconds later, our tones dropped. Uh, for the FAST team, which is a specialized uh, firefighter team that looks for down firefighters. So Westchester County had dispatched every single FAST team in the county to go to the county center for response to, to New York City. So we're waiting to assemble. Um, I think we had four people in the truck plus myself. And uh, off we go. We're going to the city. Um, uh, actually, let me backtrack. We were dispatched to Westchester County Fire Training Center. So we're going there. We get there. And um, they're giving everybody these like index cards with like next to kin information. So at that point, everybody looks at everybody and, and we realize like this is the real deal. Like we're going in. Um, you know, who, Lord knows where we're going to be. Lord knows if we're coming back. So at that time, I got a call from my father. I'm sorry, I got a call from my mother. And um, she goes, your father was at the World Trade Center. And the phone went dead. So we tried calling back forever. Meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to like, focus on this card we're supposed to be filling out, you know, now, now realizing that my father was in one of the buildings. So it seemed like it took like 25 minutes to get my mother back on the phone. And she said that, you know, my dad was okay, um, but he was inside the tower when it hit and uh, he's safe, but somewhere outside the building. So, you know, I have that whole th picture in the back of my mind. Now I'm worried about him, you know, not on what I'm going to myself, you know, and in the back of my head thinking, am I going to have to pull my father out of God knows what down there? So it took a while and I think it was like 15, another 15, 20 minutes, told everybody to go back to their trucks and, uh, we start in this one enormous convoy going to New York City, lights, sirens. And it was just surreal watching all the cars leaving New York City. I mean, 
it, it was unfathomable how many people were just trying to exit the city and they just couldn't. I mean, as far north as Westchester. So we ended up going to a firehouse somewhere in the Bronx. I forget exactly where it was. I think maybe Jerome. I want to say the 235 engine, but that might not be accurate. So we were stationed there all day waiting further instructions um, from the city what we're going to do. So as you can imagine, it was a long day, you know, it was prior to all cell phones, no one's cell phone work, everybody was dying. We couldn't get in touch with anybody. I keep trying my dad, trying my dad and just to no avail. So, you know, after watching this whole thing burn, we went out, we got lunch and then it was later in the day. I think it was around five or five 30 or so we're just watching it burn and it's still just this enormous cloud of smoke as you know so we're looking down the road and i had my my uh my friend tony martinez with me and we're all of a sudden we see this guy just walking up the street and he was just covered in dust and i'm like holy look at this guy so as we're sitting there and like people behind us started to take notice and he was way down the street 400 yards probably and he's just walking towards us walking towards us and now we have this whole crowd of like probably almost every firefighter that was dispatched to the bronx now he's closer he's 100 yards and he's getting closer and closer i'm like tony look at this guy he's just covered in dust i can't even imagine the war he's been through and then at like 50 feet my buddy tony says Jimmy, that's your dad. I was like, no, how can it be my dad? He's still down there somewhere. And covered in dust, sure enough, father, just walking up the block to make sure his boy was okay. Because we still didn't know where we were going. We didn't, you know, it was just so, it was, everything was so up in the air. So as he came up, I gave him the biggest hug. Um, and it was just, so he hugged Tony because Tony's been my best friend forever. He always considered him as his third son. Uh, so he just starts telling a story about like how the whole building just shook. And he said it was just, it, he, you couldn't imagine it. Like he couldn't even put it into words. And this is a gentleman that, you know, he was good at a story. And he just told it the best he can so what happened was the planes had hit he ran out of the building and he found the he, he found the first bodega he could find he bought every single uh disposable camera he sent one with a woman that went to staten island that he and he just started taking pictures and when they were all when he took i guess he he filled one camera he found a police officer and he said, sir, how can I help you? He goes, he's like, well, what can you do? And he says, well, I'm a volunteer firefighter up in Westchester County. Um, I know the city real good. He goes, I need all these people out of here. He goes, they just need to go. We need it out of here. So he started telling people how to get out of the city. A um, couple of women came to me. They had some, some injuries, um, more than likely minor. So he found EMS for them, for them. And uh, he just stayed as long as he could. And then I guess, you know, the, the area pretty much, um, you know, the crowds went away and then it was just firefighters and police looking for people. And at that, he, he thought it was time for him to get out of there. So he started walking towards us. Um, so it was a combination of walking and cabs and walking and cabs because he was just dead set on finding me. <clears throat> so at um, you know, we went, you know, we went over his whole story and all that stuff. Um, later on, we found his, uh, not found him, but he, um, he printed all the pictures and they were just, they were just eerie. So he will, you know, he, he just took the pictures and he just wanted to document his day. And it was actually amazing because he left the flash on 
and me as a photographer, I wouldn't have done that. But the flash just brought out all the details in the dust and just how much dust was in the air. And he took pictures of people and firefighters and police officers, and they were just covered in dust. And it was just, it was so surreal to see it. So to go back to, to my day, um, we sat there, my father eventually left and um, it start, as it started to get dark in the city, they actually, they pulled us back to Yonkers because a couple, uh, one of the firefighters told us a couple of weeks ago, uh, somebody threw a refrigerator off a roof where we were. So they were concerned for our safety. Um, so they brought us back to Yonkers. Um, they brought the Salvation Army in to feed us because we hadn't really eaten much all day because everything was closed in the Bronx where we were. And um, <clears throat> that was our assignment for the day. They said, all right, so we're going we're gonna to pick where you guys are going to go in the morning. So we slept actually in, the four of us slept in the back of the fire truck um, at the Yonkers Raceway all night long, um, covered in fire coats, trying to sleep the best we could because we didn't know what we were doing in the morning. And um, the morning came, they brought us some breakfast. They uh, sent uh, all the companies all over the city. And unfortunately we weren't picked to go to a house. So they sent us home. So <clears throat> the, actually the ride home was just as amazing as the ride too. <clears throat> so at, before we went to sleep, the uh, gentleman, Clayton White, who drove the truck, he was like, you know what? I got to go home tonight. And we were like, okay. So I took over driver responsibility. So I actually drove the fire truck home. And it was like, it was like going to a parade, like being in the parade and for, from all the way from Yonkers Raceway, all the way back to home, people just screaming and yelling at us like they basically in thanks for for what we went there to do um, <clears throat> so as uh you know the day goes over um eventually we got the pictures as, as i said we uh we you know we looked at the pictures and then 9 11 was you know, every year was a remembrance for the for the people that have we, you know, being down there. And although we didn't go to the pile, the whole that whole day just brought everything to being so real. Especially like speaking with my father. So years go by, um, and like I said, we didn't really, you know, we we always paid respect here and for. Uh, lost every single year um there was a resident local to here that uh passed up passed away and they they dedicated a park to him which was really really nice um so it was i want to say like six years prior to my father's death the three things he always uh w which were the most to him was family friends and fire department. So he had gone on to, uh, he joined multiple like county organizations um, to help as, you know, the best he could. So five years before his death, he actually, he found the Austin Fire Department's engine 100 in a barn. It was an old apparatus. So it was a 1935, the company that he belonged to was hollow hose. So at that point, he, he had to have it. So he flew out to Oregon. He verified that it was, in fact, belonged to Austin, and he bought it and trucked it back. So <clears throat> he had it. You know, he always tinkered with it. It was his pride and his joy. Um, he took it to some parades, and we put family on top of it. And, you know, he had a good time with it. 
And then I'd say like in two years later, he started having problems. He was, he, could, he was having breathing problems and he just didn't understand why. So we started going to the doctors and he always had to come with him. <clears throat> so he's like, you know, the doctor always went through, you know, what he did in his life. And, you know, we didn't really think at the time anything about 9-11 or anything about the dust. So I went to one meeting with him and the doctor, you know, he was saying, I don't know if it's COPD or emphysema, but they're both lung diseases. And he says, you do have one of them. It's just, we need to figure out which one and we can figure out treatment. So he really didn't like the <clears throat> So I went to one appointment with him and I don't know what made me think about it. And I said, doc, I says, could this be from the dust at 9-11? And he was like, your father was there? And I was like, yeah, he was there. He was in the, one of the towers. So the doctor, myself, and my father, we were talking about it. And he goes, absolutely. He goes, he goes yeah, people are starting to get sick from it. So we started, um, you know, with that. And um, we came forward with that. Um, and then I would say in the last like month before he passed, he was having these terrible like stomach pains. He couldn't keep food down and he was just, <clears throat> he would throw up food and he just, he didn't understand why. So he went to um, something at my sister's house and um, when he got there, my slowed going on. And um, she that and I yellow. She says, he's yellow. He's he's yellow, like a yellow crayon. I was like, all right, I'll take care. I put that on the phone. So I talked to him. I was like, You feeling okay? And he goes, Yeah, he goes, you know, Aaron, me, I'm yellow, and I'm like all right, well, come, we're going to make an appointment. Okay. So he comes in the morning, he comes next morning <clears throat> and he got out of his car on my driveway. And I looked at him out and I, he looked like he had a tan. So his garage was yellow, head to toe yellow. And I was like, pop, what's going on? And he goes, oh, you know, I've been having these problems, you know, eating, I said, okay, so we're going to the doctor today. So I went to the doctor. Um, they sent him right away for, I believe it was a CAT scan. And um, he got the report in a couple of days and they found a mass. So I was like, all right, pop. So our doctor referred us to a specialist in uh, Columbia Press. So we go down there. Actually, I have to back up. Um, when my father got the results, he didn't go to the doctor yet. He came in, whatever. Maybe he did have an appointment, and he got the paperwork. He'd been following a kidney doctor who he absolutely loved. So he goes, Dr. Butman, I'll know what to do. So I was like, but he, this is not a specialty. He goes, but he'll know what to do. Let's make it a appointment okay so my father goes down there unfortunately i couldn't go and i told him to put me on speaker and uh the doc so my i see my father's phone call and i was like okay let's you know we'll figure out what we're going to do at this point <clears throat> and it wasn't my father it was dr Butman. so they had already had an, an appointment for him at columbia press and he goes jimmy it's dr Butman." and i was like oh this is not good he goes no he said, we have an emergency, emergency appointment for him in New York City. He needs to be there at one. And I go, doc, I look at my watch. I go, it's 11 o'clock. He goes, I don't care how you got to get there. He needs us today. <clears throat> so take him in the car. We head down. We see the specialist. And the time frame he gave us, I believe this was a, this was a Thursday. Um, 
and he wanted to, he actually wanted to operate on Tuesday. And we had to be there Monday. They were going to admit him. <clears throat> so all this, and I'm, it's just moving very fast. And I, <laughs> the doctor actually gets up. <laughs> My father actually sat in the doctor's chair. And I said, Pop, what are you doing in his chair? He goes, my back hurts. This one seems comfortable. So the doctor comes back in and he said, you're in my chair. He goes, no one sits in my chair. He goes, but that's actually quite comical. So he's, the doctor actually sat in my father's chair. <clears throat> so yes, he, he lays out the timeline. Uh, my father says that he had to use the bathroom and it was actually a good time. <clears throat> so my father walked out of the room. I says, all right, doc. I says, my dad has no idea. He just think he's sick. I, I, I think there's something very serious. He says, Jimmy, I'm not going to lie to you. He goes, his cancer is bad. He goes, it is big. I was like, how can that be? He, he just, he goes, it's, he probably had it and he just never knew it. He goes, he was vomiting. He goes, more than likely, it's just because the cancer was so big and was pressing on everything, it just didn't allow the food to sit in there. I was like, okay. I said, so what's the plan? He goes, we're going in after it. I was like, fine. He goes, Tuesday. You know, but he needs to be here Monday for test. And then Tuesday, we're going right in after it. So I was like, okay. So he goes, normally we would keep him because the cancer is so bad, but he seems really good. I mean, he's the only person that ever sat in my chair. So, you know, he's with it. He doesn't seem to be in a lot of pain. Um, you know, I'm going to send him home. I'm going to give him some pain pills because I need him back Monday. So I'll take care of him. Don't worry. <clears throat> we went home Thursday and then Friday, Friday morning, my father calls me up and he says, I'm in a lot of pain. I go, what do you mean, Pop? He goes, I'm in so much pain, I can't even walk. And I, I was like, what? What happened from yesterday? And he says, I don't know. He goes, but something's not right inside of me. And he goes, this might be bad. And I was like, I don't know. Let's see. Let's wait for the doctor. So I gave him some pain pills. Called the doctor and he goes, you know, it's just normal. He goes, <clears throat> he goes, we might speed this up Monday, get them here early. We might operate them on Monday night. I said, okay. So every four hours I went over to check on them. Um, Saturday morning, he calls me. And we're like right before I was going over to his house. And he says, Jimmy, I'm in really, really bad shape. And I was like, what do you mean? He, <clears throat> he goes, this is just bad. He goes, I can't walk. I can't eat. I can't do anything. So I go over. And um, he was, he couldn't even walk. It was like he was a shell. And now I know what's going on with him and he doesn't. So I'm trying to keep everything together for him. It's hard. I told the doctor, I said, doc, he's in bad shape. He goes out bad. I go bad. He can't even walk. We have to carry him to the bathroom. <clears throat> so he goes, double his pain pills. And I went, what? And he says, I go, they're double them. I go, he's not even going to know where he is. And he goes, point. And everything hit me. I, I don't even know which way was up. And there's my dad just trying to he just wants to go in and get fixed. So we, you know, come back, we'll leave. We'll spend like two hours with him. We'll come back. We'll go and we'll come back. And <clears throat> he would you know, he would just try and stay positive, but he knew he was in so much pain. He's like, I just need to get to the hospital. So Monday, we bring him down. 
and uh the doc was like i ha I, I can't even he says i can't even he goes you guys were here thursday he goes there is no explanation for what turned so bad and i said i don't know i said but this is absolutely terrible he goes we're going in after it i said okay so he was too weak to go in. Um, so myself, my sister, my wife, my brother-in-law, um, we just took turns sitting with him. They, they put him in the ICU and uh, his pain was just, it was just unbearable. Um, he didn't last, I think three days in the hospital and he had passed. So the day before he passed, the doctor says, <clears throat> do you have any family that's not here? And I was like, yeah, my brother. He goes, he needs to be here right away. Okay. So he was on his way. He left that night at midnight. We got a phone call uh, shortly after. The doctor said that they had picked up some kind of acid in his blood. And uh, there, he said, we've seen it go both ways. Either it goes well or it doesn't go well. So, okay, load him up. So he says, are you, I says, do you want me down there right away? And he says, no, give me, give me a couple hours. And he goes, then, you know, bring, he goes, come to the hospital. So we received a phone call around five o'clock um, telling me that they'd start a CPR. So doctor asked me what to do. And my father, my father and I had a conversation that he didn't want to be a vegetable on a chair. And that if he couldn't enjoy his life the way he wanted to, the way he had previously, he wanted to stop, to stop. I said, doctor, what? His, he thought chances are bring back. And um, he goes, we have many minutes. And I says, okay, do your best for 20 minutes. But after that, my father's wishes are that you stop and you let him go. So 20 minutes passed. <clears throat> and we had already started heading out the door to go see him doctor called me back and he said that um, they were unable to bring him back. Asked. So um, yeah, we <clears throat> no one's ready for someone to pass that quick. Unexpected. It just stinks for the stinks for involved. Um, with the fire department put together a beautiful funeral for my father the guys that he, my father was in an old uh, fire truck club it's called the Fort Fairchester Holes Haulers and come to find out way back in 68 before I was born my father did all old time firefighting was a founding he actually founded helped found this club he was one of the original members so they had uh, they brought his old fire truck down, and uh, so they're getting ready and they have it down. And one of the guys is you know starting it up. And <clears throat> in addition to my own fire department, um, one of the guys came to me and he says, "Hey, he goes, I don't know if this is possible, but you're all really love for his last ride to be in his fire truck." And uh, I was like, I'll ask the funeral director. So I spoke with the funeral director, who's actually a friend of mine. And he says, I've been doing this a long time. And he goes, I've never seen this done here. And I says, is it possible? And he says, absolutely. So his, his last ride was in. So... 
Absolutely. Everything was absolutely beautiful. Couldn't, I couldn't ask for more. So one notable thing, um, I'm in the fire truck with, um, and we had left the church. We're going to, um, we're going to this day. And I get a phone call and it was Columbia Presbyterian. So I look at the phone. I was like, I didn't know what to think. I was like, what could they be calling me for? It's just a weird time to be calling me. Are they calling me for, are they calling me to settle up debt or whatever the case may be? So I let the phone call go to voicemail. So we go to the cemetery, have this beautiful, um, beautiful uh, ceremony for my father. And it was all said and done. And my brother and my sister, we all wanted to uh, take a picture. We now call the, uh, the drone family fire truck. And uh, we take some pictures, you know, we hug all the people that come. And uh, I listened to the voicemail, and it was my father's nurse. And she said to me, and she leaves in a, a voicemail for me. She goes, hey, James, I know you're going through a lot of problems right now. You know, it's a difficult time. She goes, <clears throat> I was your father's nurse right up until the end, and um when we brought him up to CCU, I, uh, ICU on his last day, he wanted me to tell, he told me something. And uh, she says, uh, my, um, your father talked highly about you. And he says, my father told the nurse that my son is a really great guy and that he would do whatever. And she says, I know it's a difficult time for you. I know you have a lot going on. You're probably really busy right now. And she goes, um, I felt that I needed to make this phone call for you so that you knew that your father loves you. And at the time, I was just so blown away because I mean, it was impeccable that this woman actually called me when I was in my father's fire truck going to the cemetery. So I actually ended up calling her back and uh, we had a conversation. She's like, your father, all he did was talk about his, his kids and that he loved you very much. Um, and then he asked, you know, please tell, tell, tell us on. So time went, time went on. You know, grieving is very tough. Um, and then especially from something like this. Um, so prior to my father's death, he was a crossing guard. And he actually, he passed away as still a crossing guard because everything happened so fast. So he knew all the kids' names. He crossed them all. Um, he spent his work, his life working to provide for his family. And he's held some, some really great jobs. But in the end, it was crossing the kids that was absolute, brought him the most joy. And it was just, it was amazing. <clears throat> so when he started to get sick, prior to me knowing about it and with the food and all that stuff, his dedication was nothing short of amazing. He actually went to work and he ate breakfast or he didn't eat breakfast. You know, he wouldn't eat breakfast because he had to go to work and he didn't want to be nauseous for the kids. So he would end up eating breakfast early, going to his street corner early where his post was. He would sit in the car and he would actually wait for him to himself to get sick and he would go around the side of the car where no one could see him and he vomited in a bag every day 
just so he could cross those kids. He's probably one of the strongest men that I've ever met. And the dedication, I mean, he's retired. Um, he didn't need to work, but he thought it was his duty to make sure those kids cross safely to go to school. So after his passing, a little time went by and I started, I reached out to the mayor in, in our town and I said, hey, mayor, um, can I have a, you know, can I sit down with you and talk about my dad a little bit? And she loved my father because his, her kids crossed right where my father was. He knew them all by name. So I have a meeting with her and she was like, you know, we do have a lot of street we have a few streets here in town named for people, but we don't have a process. So, okay. So how do we make a process? And she's like, that's a good question. So I believe it took almost a year of the village creating a process and me pestering her quite often because I was hell bent on getting this done for my father. And then it was almost a year later in February, they unveiled a, uh, the street corner from where he was his, uh, where his crossing guard post was. So the corner of Sherman and Croton Avenue is James A. Drowen, uh, I think it's Boulevard. So we had a nice, um, we had a beautiful ceremony for him. 100 plus we brought it down and uh that's pretty much it jim i'm so sorry i'm so sorry uh so we get this straight from the height less than a week after he was diagnosed with cancer yep. and what type of cancer was it, was it? pancreatic cancer and by the time they found it, obviously it was stage four yep. cancer. No. Yes. No. So oh. they wouldn't even tell me what stage he was at. They just told me it was large. So I had looked at his, um, his, uh, the report, roughly the size of a soda can. It was big for the pancreas. Pancreas is small. Um, and it was, you know, the doctor said it was just putting so much pressure on. Him. How many days after the diagnosis did it, was it five? I think it was, uh, I think it was eight. Wow. What's his job at the world? Gym? So he worked for AIG. He was, uh, it was, uh, he was in like a tech position. Um, a colleague couldn't make it to the meeting. My father loved the city and he was like, I'll go. So I, it was just bad luck that he was there. And you were a volunteer firefighter with Austin as well. Yes. As him? Right. You, you were. Okay. And your life was spared because you didn't go right. down there. Right. And now I, you know. And did you work on the pile at no. all in the months we after? Didn't get down. Your life was spared. Yep. Yes, yeah. it was. I do know quite a few friends um, that are sick. Um, so actually, two, it was like, two or three weeks before 9-11, we had a friend that was stationed right there on the, uh, the Lower West Side. And they were, so we went down there and my friend showed us, you know, their firehouse. And <clears throat> we stayed, um, you know, a couple hours with them down there. We had a good time. And um, they lost just about every person in that house that was working that day. And my friend, for some reason, wasn't working, but he had gone down. 
It was just a terrible, terrible day. The law provides not only for the responders of New York City free health care, no cost prescriptions for their 9 11 illnesses, and compensation for 9 11 cancers and severe respiratory illnesses and death. It's for those who came in from Ossining and from every state covers them. And most people are not aware that they are provided for and are not taking away from the New York City first responders. There's care for all in every state. There's compensation for all who need it for the next 70 years. And so for those who are not yet sick, God forbid they get sick in the future, Jim, they need to know that they need to get two witnesses now right. that can sign an affidavit that they were there in case the witnesses are gone if and when they get sick. Right. And you and I had talked because of my exposure, myself and my friend Tony's exposure to my father. Because, you know, in our when he came up there, I, you know, we hugged like it was you know, the dust was nothing. And yeah, I was right on his shoulder breathing that in, unfortunately. Are you People, registered? No, but we're going to, we're going to make that happen after our conversation a week ago. Spread the word. We've got to get the word. All volunteers came in who were collected to come in. Right. And who could either be sick now or even if they recovered from cancer, even if they're in remission, it's all covered and they just don't. And we've got yeah. to get the word out. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, I think pretty much that's it. I think that was, you know, our day, unfortunately.